Hi, Dr. Washer, do you see me? I do. And you can hear me just fine? I can. Okay, perfect. So thanks everybody for um, joining us for today's Instagram live discussion. We're going to be talking about COVID-19 today. My name is Ed Bottomley with the Michigan Medicine Department of Communication, and I'm joined today by Dr. Lorraine Washer. She is going to answer some of our questions. She is the Medical Director of Infection Control at Michigan Medicine. So, Dr. Washer, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks a lot. Good to be here. And let's jump in with some of these questions. The first one um, that I have, this is, this is one to do with the transparency that we have at Michigan Medicine. We push out pretty much on a daily basis the numbers of inpatients and things like that affected with COVID-19. Um, should we be encouraged that in Michigan, the number of hospitalized COVID-19 patients is flattening or decreasing? Yeah, absolutely. We um, are actually very grateful and encouraged by uh, the pattern of declines in our hospitalized patients, both patients who are doing well um, and being discharged from the hospital, um, as well as uh, decreasing numbers of patients who are needing to be admitted for COVID in the hospital. So clearly, um, those who are the sickest with COVID, we're seeing fewer of those coming in. Um, what we have to keep an eye on, though, is the number of patients on total who are still getting COVID in Michigan. Um, and although the numbers are declined from their peak across the state of Michigan, we are still seeing a relatively large number of patients, uh, up to 1,000 or so patients every day across the state of Michigan with new diagnoses of COVID. Um, so I will say that I think that we have hit our peak, um, but maybe we're also at a plateau that we're not all the way down the downward slope uh, for patients um, in the community. Thank you for that. And the next question is really a follow on to that. Um, are you concerned about a second surge and how might that happen? Yeah, I actually am quite concerned about the possibility of a second surge of COVID. Um, the reason for that is a couple fold. One is that we know uh, with novel infections uh, that we have seen in the past, there is often a second surge. And so, for instance, um, with the 1918 influenza pandemic, um, we saw an early peak um, in the spring summertime of 1918, and then it really came back and was very deadly um, over, over the next uh, uh, winter time uh, peak. We also saw something similar with the H1N1 2009 flu, where we saw an initial um, emergence of the, of the virus in the springtime. And then uh, when seasonal uh, respiratory viruses came back in the fall and summer, we saw a, a peak that was above what we originally saw. So I am concerned about that. And I think that if we see that, um, we're gonna see potentially um, an early um, indicator of that as we open up our state. Um, and if we start to see cases rise, um, as we have uh, less social distancing, uh, we're going to need to make some decisions about um, whether we uh, change course um, or not. Thank you for that. Um, the next question, we've got, a, we've got a series of questions on, on, on this very broad topic, and I know things are changing quite quickly. What do we know about how the disease is transmitted? Yeah, um, the best evidence really suggests that uh, COVID, the disease uh, caused by the SARS uh, coronavirus 2, um, is transmitted like many respiratory viruses, which is primarily from close contact with droplet spread. And that means that droplets that come uh, from an infected patient um, from the respiratory tract um, travel um, short distances um, and may hit someone else's mouth, eyes, or nose and cause sort of that direct uh, droplet uh, exposure. Um, and it's kind of interesting because the word droplet um, really came from the word drop um, and meaning that it really was heavy and could only travel about six feet. And so um, in general, we think that those large respiratory droplets travel about six feet. Um, the other way that this virus can spread is through contamination of the environment. Um, so those droplet viruses, those droplet particles that have virus in them can uh, sit on a surface um, and they can survive for a variety of of, of time depending upon the type of um, the type of the surface anywhere from a day uh, on something like cardboard to up to three days on something like stainless steel 
Um, and so we um, may inadvertently pick up those live viruses on our hands, rub our eyes, um, or touch our face and inoculate ourselves with virus. Um, and then lastly, I will say that uh, there is a potential for aerosol spread, particularly in an opportunistic way. Um, and, and, and that occurs when um, in hospitals and other settings where patients may have an aerosol generating procedure, such as being intubated um, or having some other type of procedure where the airways are manipulated. Um, and so that's our best understanding of how uh, the virus is spread. In terms of COVID-19, as an epidemiologist, what concerns you most about it? I think as an epidemiologist, my concern, my biggest concern is that we don't have enough data about the number of people who are actually infected. Um, and that lack of data um, really um, impacts the modeling that can be done to predict how many new patients are going to be infected and also um, what the slope of increase or decrease might be. So I think that this really begs uh, the need for more testing um, and testing uh, for those who have active disease so that we can institute um, things that we know work, such as isolation for people who are infected or quarantine and those who are exposed. Um, and so our hope is that we can continue to have more and more testing so that our approach to this during this, this end of this wave, but perhaps in a second wave might be more effective. Thank you for that. And this is a little bit of a follow on question to this. What do you wish people knew about this disease? Yeah, I think a lot of us wish we knew a lot more about this disease. Um, but I think that um, a couple of things. One is that this disease can have a, a wide variation in how it affects people. Some people may be asymptomatic, have no idea that they have the disease at all, feel entirely well, while others may be so sick that they end up in an intensive care unit and it can be fatal for some people. Um, and so when you have a disease that has that degree of difference in the way it can affect people, it can be very hard um, to approach from a medical standpoint. Um, we know also um, that those, those, those individuals who have certain risk factors like being older than age 65 or having uh, common uh, comorbidities, we call them things like heart disease or lung disease, or maybe on uh, immunosuppressive therapy for cancer, um, are more likely to have severe disease as well. And it's not just the virus, it's our, it's our response to the virus that's actually um, part of the problem. Uh, the immune response, the inflammatory response is really a, a huge part of uh, how it affects uh, patients with COVID infection. Thank you. And, and again, this, this one follows on to that question. How will we learn more about this disease? So I think we're learning every day about COVID infection and we're learning primarily from our patients. Um, we're learning from our patients by observing um, how they're responding to treatments and not just antivirals or specific treatments for COVID, but how they might respond to specific things that we do for their supportive care. Our pulmonologists are uh, uh, learning what's the best way to ventilate patients on the ventilator, what positions are the best uh, for them to be managed in. And we're learning also um, about what other complications can occur from the disease. Um, so we're learning from the patients and we're learning by sharing what we know um, from the patients we care for with others in the medical community. Um, and then secondarily, um, we'll learn on a more um, uh, a more study-based component uh, doing studies of antivirals or other anti-inflammatory uh, uh, drugs to determine really how can we um, change very specifically the outcomes for patients. Um, those types of learnings are slow to come by um, and we're just now starting to get a glimpse of what things work and, and what things don't work in that way. Fantastic. So for those just joining us, um, if you've just jumped onto this live chat, this is a COVID-19 Instagram live. Nice little quick uh, chat with, with our expert panelist who's agreed to come on, uh, Dr. Lorraine Washer, Medical Director of Infection Control at Michigan Medicine. We're getting her expertise here as an epidemiologist. Um, the next question we have, does everyone need a test? Mm -hmm. So I don't think everyone needs a test. I think that we need to be very careful about how we use the available tests that we have. Um, but what we need to do is be able to treat people, uh, test people, uh, and be very specific and intentional about who we test so that we can use that information to get us um, further down uh, the prevention pathway. And so people who need a test are those who have symptoms that they could be concerned could be due to COVID. 
Um, that can be anything from fever, cough, shortness of breath, can sometimes be diarrhea um, um, or muscle aches. Um, and those people need to be tested so that they get a diagnosis, but also so that we can know if their contacts, people that they're close to, also have infection so we can test them. Um, and then, then um, keep those individuals um, either under watch to make sure they don't develop symptoms or quarantine them or keep them away from large public spaces so they don't transmit to others. The second part of uh, testing though that I think is really important is what we would call surveillance. And so that's testing people um, as some component of the population. It's not everyone, but it's a representative sample of the population to sort of randomly check at intervals of time to determine if COVID exists um, so that we can get a, get a determination of whether there's a, a high amount in the community or a low amount in the community and we can plan accordingly. Thank you for that. Um, the next series of questions are on a topic, masks. What are the benefits to a handmade mask? Can I wash it? How should I wash it? Mm -hmm. So handmade masks have been recommended by the Centers for Disease Control for um, individuals in the community. Um, that's in uh, distinction to medical masks that are used by healthcare providers. The homemade masks really um, are used to uh, provide a barrier. Uh, and, and the primary role is really uh, to provide a barrier between the wearer and their environment. So that if the person wearing the mask happens to be sick and doesn't know it, they're not um, transmitting those respiratory droplets to other people in public spaces, um, et cetera. And so um, that's the primary role for wearing uh, a mask uh, for this pandemic for the community. Um, certainly, if you have a homemade mask at home, you want it to be washable. Um, and um, it can be washed um, in your regular washing machine, probably at the highest temperature setting um, that uh, the material will tolerate. And also uh, drying um, also has effect on killing respiratory viruses, et cetera. Um, or you could hang it out to dry in the sunshine, which we're starting to get a little bit in Michigan. Thankfully, thankfully. Um, the next mask question we have up, do I need to wear a mask outside? I think that is entirely um, a personal choice. So one of the things that um, helps uh, disperse our respiratory viruses is just the air, uh, the airflow. And so one of the reasons why you're in an enclosed setting and in a public space that masks are recommended is that there's just not a lot of air exchanges. Um, when you're outside and there's wind blowing and there's a large open space, there's a lot of, um, of um, disruption of the air and also um, uh, decrease in the amount of virus and it kind of just blows away. Um, and so for the most part, it's not as important to wear a mask in an outdoor space. Some people choose to do so and, and that's, that's fine. Um, but um, our governor has actually stated through the state of Michigan through executive order that it's really uh, for public places that are indoors that the masks are required. Thank you for that. The next question we have up, as restrictions ease up over the coming months, what can people at risk of serious illness do to protect themselves? Right. So I think um, hopefully in lockstep with the epidemiology coming down, we'll be able to see some restrictions um, lifted uh, in our state, um, but that risk isn't going to go down to zero. And so people, particularly who are those who are at risk for severe outcomes, really should continue to do several things. Um, one of them um, would be just the basic things that we've said, even from the beginning, um, which is to wash your hands, um, particularly when you're out in public. And, and, and that can be with uh, just soap and water or using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Um, and then maintaining that social distance. So it is, we've all learned a lot of new habits about social distance lately. And I think that if you're an immunocompromised person or someone who's at increased risk, you're gonna need and want to do that social distancing, uh, staying six feet away from people, avoiding large crowds, um, and really thinking about um, why you're interacting in a particular environment um, uh, for a longer period of time than maybe the general public would. Um, so I think in addition, you may still want to wear a mask, even after uh, the normal population uh, may feel less important to do so. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, next question. The urgent care down the street is offering antibody tests. Are these likely to be accurate? So um, I can't speak specifically to a specific antibody test, but I will say that there are um, 
a large number of serology tests or antibody tests that are being developed. Um, and many of them are good. Some of them are not good. Um, and so it's really important that we think about why, what, what an antibody test would tell us. So there's two things. One is an antibody test is meant to tell us whether we have developed a protein or an antibody um, that targets the COVID virus um, and to tell us whether we've been infected before or not infected. Um, and it may be fairly good at that, um, telling us whether we've developed an antibody. Um, but what we don't know about those antibody tests is whether it predicts whether we'll have um, long-term immunity, whether it will prevent us from getting a severe COVID infection in the future. And so I think that we still need a little patience as the scientific community develops these tests to determine how best to use them um, for public health as well as for personal health. Thank you, thank you for that. And we're, we're moving into our final two questions. Next one for you, Dr. Washer. What kind of changes should the public make as things start to open up again? So I think it's similar to what we talked about with individual patients, but I think that we all have to be um, really cognizant of what we're doing in public um, and, and really just maintaining that social distancing um, and really thinking about what we're doing and allowing people um, to make their best judgments so that you don't invade their space if they're worried about being close to others. Um, and and um, I think we've all learned a little bit about how to interact, um, whether it be um, you know, on, on specific platforms uh, such as Zoom or Instagram or those sorts of things. So I think that, um, I think we're gonna see changes and people are gonna hang on to some of this um, distance um, interactions, but at the same time, We've all um, sort of not had those interactions that most of us want to have with our family or friends. And so we're going to have to be really thoughtful about how we do that um, into the future. So, Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you for that. Final question for you. Are there other countries or states that have done important things to mitigate disease spread as things return to normal? Yeah, I think that we've seen some examples, mostly from other countries, um, about um, using a couple of things. One, um, and I'll say some examples might be places like South Korea, um, maybe New Zealand um, are areas that have really um, been able to measure the amount of COVID and, and keep those numbers down. They've done two things I think very well. Um, one is that they've done a lot of testing and that testing has included asymptomatic people. Um, and with that, uh, when they have positives, they do that contact tracing which is to identify all the individuals that that infected patient has been around and appropriately test them and, and then divide them in those people into infected versus non-infected um, uh, and institute quarantine if that's appropriate. So um, we have a challenge in the United States, I think on those two counts, really can we get enough testing to be done and we can, can we do it in a way where we can do that kind of contact tracing um, and I think that at the public health level, those are the two things that we're most interested um, in uh, putting our efforts into. Fantastic. So that wraps up all the questions that we have. Is there anything you think that we've missed? Is there anything that you wanna leave our, our viewers with? No, I think um, in general, um, we all um, need to have compassion for each other and to understand where we're coming from with regards to how, how we're gonna continue to do uh, some level of social distancing at least um, into the next calendar year while we wait for a vaccine. So we can continue to wash our hands. We can continue um, to be cognizant um, that we um, need to wear masks when that's the appropriate thing to do um, and um, really uh, be open uh, to changes that might occur. Uh, we might be asked to go back to more social distancing instead of less. And so I think we just have to listen to the data and uh, follow directions that we're given as best as we can. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time and your expertise, Dr. Lorraine Washer. Great, thank you. Bye now. Bye, thanks.